How are you guys doing today? Very good. good. Listen, it's always good when you guys are laughing because, uh, you know, to start the interview off. Let's go with the positive. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, she's pretty funny. <laughs> I agree. So I, I have to start. Listen, uh, the movie on this date that we're doing the interview, the movie has crossed over $850 million worldwide, which is like staggering. It's the biggest R-rated movie of all time. When you guys first got involved in this thing, like what did you actually think in terms of like box office? Like this might be like a, people might want to see it. Could make a few hundred million dollars. Did you ever think that it was going to be as successful as it's turned into? Uh, not the success it's had currently. I think I knew there'd be a lot of interest for sure. There was definitely like, we're making a movie about Joker who is as infamous a character in comic book history. There were a lot of eyes going to be watching this movie and that Warner's was making a pretty safe bet that they'd recoup some money on it. I thought maybe 300, 350 if I was a betting man. So it's about 500 more than that. <laughs> I think they're doing pretty well. Completely. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I don't normally think about box office when I take on projects, but I, 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 um, I definitely thought that it was going to be a little bit more controversial, you know, that there was going to be a bit more irritation for the lack of uh, action in the <laughs> right like that <laughs> the, the movie, movie yeah. would disappoint sort yeah. of like the standard bear audience member that yeah. i think we've come to assume is the audience member and i think exactly. one of the surprises of the movie yeah and and a pleasant surprise is that it has served as an as a sort of a a, a opposite of of this idea that audiences need more, more, more action, yeah. all this, like the attention span is yeah. so so short that they need to be sort of fed information all the time, lots of characters, all these things. And this movie sits on the opposite side of that spectrum yeah. and to still have its success, I think is one of the w most wonderful surprises. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I think it really, I think the audience probably also just, you know, appreciates it that, that that it's just it's it's a it's a human movie with real actors and and no CGI. It's it's like it's a, it's an actual city. It's actual you know emotions and and uh, and that's kind of what's what's driving it. Completely. Yeah. I, I, com I that's the other thing that I uh, completely agree with what you're saying. It is a real character study. Mm. It's really not one of these every eight minutes, some action set piece. Yeah. I mean, it, it lives and breathes by Joaquin and everyone else's performances. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing that it's done so well, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And it also just like gives the audience a little bit of, you know, cause it's, it's rather like slow paced compared to movies today. And I think I always really appreciate when as, 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 as an audience to some, you know, if, if I'm watching something, if I'm taking something in that I have the time to, digest how I feel about things instead of being force fed stuff, you know, it's like feel this, feel this all the time. It's, it's, it gives you a bit of time to to think about what you feel about the uh, about the story. And, you know, I, I, uh, I, it seems like the audience has appreciated that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I tend to even in the big movies and so many of our sort of big releases nowadays are predicated on these event picture ideas. And this is certainly an event picture in so much as the event is 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 Joker, right? Mm -hmm. Like that makes it an event picture sort of by um, definition. But I've found even like, let's say the first two hours of Avengers, I don't know how long it was, the last one, Endgame, sure. which was a lot of setup prior to this massive fight. I was so interested in the setup. I was mm -hmm. so interested in really sort of figuring out the emotions of each one of these characters as they approach this thing. And so this movie is sort of just that setup. Mm -hmm. And I think audiences appreciate it more than I think we gave them credit for. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I was going to say that I, I've, I've mentioned this to the people at Marvel. Do you know in the Avengers when they were sitting around at a table and they were talking about stuff and they're debating who can pick up the hammer? I said, I could watch a two hour movie yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't need an action scene. I just want to see them bantering about going to the movie theaters to see a movie, mm -hmm. like just hanging out with them. Uh, yeah. I, I, that's exactly my point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like that was enough, right? Yeah. Dianu. Yeah. Yeah. That's a Jewish thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that was not the expected. Yeah, yeah. that's a Passover <laughs> right. thing. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, Dianu, that, that is enough. Right? Yeah. Uh, I, I want to jump backwards. I have individual questions for each of you. I'll, I'll start uh, with you. You have a history with Todd. You've worked with him for a number of years. 
How did Todd first mention to you that the Joker movie was going to happen? Was it something that like, was he casual about it or you know what I mean? Like those first conversations. Yeah. I think he was super excited that he had sort of come up with this idea that he was really happy with, which was, I think I found a way in to get a movie made within this universe. Uh, that is obviously the, the, the comic book universe, let's say, but his own way. And he's like, I think it's really cool. It's like, it's basically just a character study of one of the, you know, most famous characters. And then he told me what it was. And I was like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. And he's like, and we, I think we can do it if we keep it small enough, do it exactly the way sort of I imagine, which is just really much, really just delve into the mind of Joker and make it something completely original. So he was, he was super excited because I think he knew he was onto something that would make for a really good script and was super castable and he could get Warners to sign off and make it. Did he say to you back then, like, how does it work with you guys? Cause you've shot a number of things. Yeah. Do you want to shoot this? Or is it sort of like, you're coming along, just say yes. No, he actually did say, do you want to shoot this? And I said, yes. And then he goes, I just want to check. Cause I just want to make sure, you know, you've directed before and do you want to shoot this? And I was like, yes. And he's like, cause I just want to make sure, do you want to shoot this? And I was like, literally like going, do you want me to say no? I'm not sure what do you, what do you, maybe he did. I just never said no. So here I am. No, I, I he did, he did actually ask me, did I want to? And I was hundred percent on board, but uh, yeah, I mean, who knows? Sure. But yeah, it was, it was a funny conversation. Cause when I hung up, I turned to my wife and I was like, did he want me to say no? I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> How long did you know about the project before it became public knowledge? Um, I don't know. I, I read it about a year or so before we made it. I, I guess so. Yeah, it was, I was actually in Atlanta making Godzilla. And I guess it was probably around October. So just about a year from when we actually started principal photography. Had it been announced, no, maybe a month or two later, maybe a month before, after that it was announced got that it. he was making this movie. Jumping into how you got involved, uh, I don't believe you've worked with Todd before. No. So what is that, how, what was that first conversation? How did you first connect? Um, well, he just called me and um, said that he was working on a film and uh, said if, asked if I was interested in re reading a script. and. I of course uh, was, and, and uh, it turned out to be this film, and, and I was I was really drawn to the script. The script was just it was really fantastic. I think it's one of the best scripts I've ever read. It was really, really, really drew me in, and uh, and then he asked if I was interested in doing some music based on what I felt from the script. So I think he was kind of curious to hear how I heard the script and how I heard the story, and and. Uh, so I wrote um, a bunch of music that ended up being the kind of core, core music that was uh, that was in the, the kind of the, the, the bones of the um, of the whole score, and uh, uh, yeah. So so they used a lot of the music while they were shooting, uh, and I think it was pretty influential on, on a lot of the performances in the in the in the film. I want to go backwards though. Do you know how it was that he connected with you? Did was it like an agent? Was it that he'd heard something else you had done? Like he heard the music from Sicario or you know? Yeah, I think he went to the. Um, so he went to the. He saw Sicario in the in the cinema. I think it was. So he he. It must have been like April when he called me. I think you guys started sh shooting in like September. We were prepping in May. Yeah, we just yeah. started right at the beginning yeah. of October. Right? Exactly. Or no, yeah. September. September 11th was actually our first day of shooting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So I started probably like in, in uh, yeah, in April, and and he. So I think he had just like seen Sicario too, um, sometime before that, and then he really liked that, and then he started listening to my albums, which he which he really liked, and then um, his music editor Jason Reuter is, is someone who's worked on on pretty much all of the um, films he's done the last 10 years. And he was he was also kind of uh, very drawn to my music. So I think they had a conversation about it that, that I was probably the right person for the job. So, so um, yeah, so I think that's, that's how they found me. 
Uh, one of the things that's great about talking to you guys about the movie today, after it's made almost a billion dollars, which is insane, is everyone's seen it. So now we can go into the spoiler territory. Um, one of the things that I think is fantastic about the film, one of the many things, is that you can make the argument that everything that happened in the movie actually happened, and you can make just as valid an argument that nothing in the movie happened, that it was all in his head, he's in Arkham imagining things. Yeah. Personally, do you have a take on, do you think he actually did these things? Do you think this is real? Do you think it is all in his head? Have you ever said publicly like what your internal thoughts are? Um, well, I think, I think that's the magic of, uh, of fiction is, is that, you know, it can be anything. I mean, all fiction can be you know, can have happened in, I mean, it's fiction, of course, so it's obviously yeah, it is yeah. not real. But, but uh, you know, I think sometimes you feel it's real and sometimes you feel it's it's fiction, but sometimes it, you know, it, it doesn't really even, I think it doesn't even matter. It's just like, you know, you're, you're just drawn into the story and the beauty of fiction is like, you know, it, it takes you out of the real world and you're just like in this, in this world where you're just outside of everything that, 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 um, yeah, that, that doesn't matter, really. Okay. Do you, do you have a take on it? Or do you like... Yeah, I do have a take. I actually... And again, it's just a personal perspective because I think other people can, like you said, make the exact argument opposite mm -hmm. of this. I believe it happened. I believe it happened in part because I also... I find movies that in which it's like, hey, it was all a dream outside of The Wizard of Oz, which is pretty good. Uh, I, uh, I find them to be unsatisfying. Yeah. I, I find them to be a little bit unsatisfying because I feel like you're taking me on this journey and I like to believe what I'm seeing has some cause and effect to other people's lives and not just in the mind of the person telling mm -hmm. it. So I like to believe that it happened. Mm -hmm. sure. That's my personal perspective. What's interesting about the film though is that I think there are scenes in the film that you can make the argument That's that, a different thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like, for yeah. example, the, and again, let's just talk spoilers, the very yeah. end of the film, yeah. when he's in Arkham and he is going down that hallway after mm -hmm. talking to the woman, mm -hmm. uh, Todd and Joaquin said that when they shot it, and you know this, obviously, is that every take was completely different. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. So what's great about that is, like, I think him in the hallway mm -hmm. is just who the hell knows what that is. That yeah. That's probably an unreliable narrator. Yeah. But him sitting in the talking to the person in the room, I think is real. Yeah. I think that's a great perspective on yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. But and I think and that's an example of like, yeah. you could also, yes, of course, like that's, that's your perspective on it. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but it's also yeah. beautiful because I think a lot of, a lot of things changed, a lot of things about reality changed throughout, like from the script to that's the shooting. Exactly I remember right. like the day where I, where I came on set, Todd was kind of running around because he's like, yeah, we're changing the whole Sophie narrative and like that's, and, and, you know, it's like, oh, okay, where's that going to go? And then it was, you know, became this question of, like you say, if she's real or not real and, and you know, because in the, in the script she was real and then she, she became not real and, and that's where I think where it's, it's so beautiful that when that twists happen and you're just like, holy shit, that wasn't real, like that was all, you know, yeah. that was all made up. That kind of, it kind of, that's why I'm saying it, that it doesn't really matter if it's real or if it's not because it's like, it's, it's taking you out there and it's like, some parts could be real, like these parts are maybe not real and then, and, and that's just kind of a part of the beauty, it's like, what, what just happened there, you know, it's, it's um, Yeah, like, and that was a it. large part of the movie was, was yeah. actually, adjusting it in real time yeah. like the script as hilder said is fantastic and from the script alone you go we can make a fantastic movie exactly but the fact that and it's one of the best things that of todd as a filmmaker is he's really open and, and in fact yeah. not just open but makes it a big part of his filmmaking experience yeah. to constantly sort of adjust the making of the movie yeah. and the narrative as you make it and yeah. and it's sort of a real-time experiment yeah. um it's interesting, you know, one of the things, because of that, we shot the movie out of order, which is more common than shooting it in order. But one of the things that was beneficial about that was that Joaquin was able to explore things like the bathroom scene in which Hilder's music really informed that entire scene, right? Prior to that, we were shooting scenes as scripted, adjusting them, but also as a discovery of who Arthur is. And then, and then we, 
we did that scene, which which had a, had some play, and then he got to play Joker for like a week when we shot Murray Franklin. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the movie now is being informed by two versions of what he's done. Mm -hmm. And so you're able to now make adjustments in real time. And, uh, and I think that's that the movie is a result of all those yeah. things and all yeah. those adjustments that were happening throughout the making of the movie, all the way up yeah. until the last day. Yeah. No, it's, it was a beautiful, beautiful filmmaking process. I think where, as you're saying, like all the elements had such so much space to grow and to really like the, he has like so much trust to all the people involved and just like gives you so much space to grow with the whole process of making the film it's like no, none of the elements you, you felt were like running after everything it was just like felt that every every single element just had so much space to to grow in the whole entire process and i think that's what at least for me, it made it really special because you know so often the, the music is kind of running after the the last right. edit and post. But but for me to have been such a big part of the whole process because as you were saying, like you know, because I I had written this music just kind of from from what I imagined from from you know I imagined the, this kind of pace and this kind of feeling and this sort of mindset for him to be in and then. You know, he's using that on set, and that can really inform every, all the elements on set. And then they started sending me daily. It's like the bathroom scene, for example, yeah. was the first, the first scene that they sent back to me, and it was just like so magnificent to, to see like, wow, this is exactly what I had in mind. Because I, I never really spoke to Todd about it. Like when I sent him the music, I was like, he's just gonna think I'm some weirdo from from Iceland. <laughs> he's never gonna want to work with me again if I, if I tell him what went through my head with all these like movements and uh, like all these all these feelings that I had behind it. And I was like, holy shit, this is exactly, <laughs> this is exactly what I felt. And Joaquin was just like dancing what I felt. And it was just unbelievable yeah. to feel how all of that grew without even ever having a dialogue about it. You know, it was just such a special process. And then as I started to receive the dailies, you know, I could also start res responding to the cinematography and the, and the choreography and the feeling like as I was expanding the, you know, the themes and the orchestration and, you know, so I could really kind of follow what they were doing on set from, from, from my studio. And it was just a really beautiful Yeah, and it, it makes process. such a difference, you know, as opposed to the traditional thing where some directors will play music that might inform the pace of the scene or t certainly temp, which is really hard for a composer to deal with. But in this case, you know, we were able to use your, your music and that certainly that piece, mm -hmm. it helps you realize its effect on both the actor, the yeah. camera pacing, the yeah. movement. Yeah. It's like it's basically, you know, and sometimes we would just have it in our earpieces piped into the actual underneath the dialogue track. So it felt like suddenly you were, as you're making the movie, you're also watching the final movie, yeah. which is has such an influence on, on the, the final product. Yeah. I, I want to ask you guys, uh, the thing about every movie is the editing room, you know, is the final rewrite. So yeah. much can change. Mm -hmm. uh, for both of you, did you end up, do you remember a lot of deleted scenes that you were sad to see go? And I'm curious, how much did you end up scoring of stuff that like didn't end up making the final movie? You know, there's that delicate thing where all of a sudden you might, he might pull something out and then you have to rework a whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because obviously I've done six moves with Todd. I, I, I had a, certainly a very early screening with Todd, like very, very early in which I watched the movie in its form post sort of assembly. And Todd's really good. He, he works differently than a lot of directors I've worked with, which is he goes reel by reel. Sometimes you'll sort of massage scenes, get it sort of to a shorter length. He just systematically goes through until he gets to basically his first assembly is a very, very strong cut as is. I watched that cut, gave a bunch of notes, and then I didn't watch another cut until the end, until it was like effectively the cut that it is now. And it's hard for me ever to press any scenes back in the movie that I don't think have real necessity emotionally. Mm -hmm. Like there's not something, there were some scenes we shot. We shot a scene with, with him in the bank with Sophie that to me is like a wonderful piece of dailies. It was like probably our first week of sh shooting. And it was like, it's, I saw the cut version of that scene because we cut it early. And I still wish that scene could just, we could just watch it as film fans watching Joaquin Phoenix work because it's a really lovely scene, um, but it has no place in the movie now, you know? And there's nothing really that I saw get dropped from the movie 
that really has any place in the final movie because the movie's really tight. I agree. You know, and it's like you can make an argument, but it doesn't it doesn't appreciably make the movie better. So it's nothing I miss. There's like one wide shot I wish you put in. <laughs> I think Todd said to me, or maybe it was Joaquin, that uh, that when he came out for the Murray Franklin show like 13 times each one was different yes there's like a he said there's like a two minute montage he has of all the alt versions of him coming out yeah and and like as a film fan how fun would it be just to watch all those versions yeah. right i said, I said to him he needs to put it on instagram well like, yeah. get it out there. right it's like because you can watch this master actor kind of do something sort of interesting each one is its own could make an argument it should be in the movie right it's Completely. not like one was bad yeah um so yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll probably never see the light of day. Never, <laughs> never. So I, I'm curious, what was it like for you? Because, you know, you know, you're obviously writing, and then you have music, and then he's doing another edit, and you have to tighten it up or make mm -hmm. some changes. Mm -hmm. So what, what was that process like? Well, the great thing about starting so early and the great thing about, like, setting the tone so early was that, like, the tone was there from the beginning, like, and the... And the um, um, the kind of the feel of the score was there from beginning, so that made the whole process, you know, everything that followed after made it kind of a lot easier because I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't have to spend any time like figuring out what story I was telling, you know, I, I always knew that. But of course, um, I mean, it's it's a movie, so you know, a lot of stuff changes all the time, and and um, so there was definitely a lot of, well, not a lot, but there were there were like a few kind of problem scenes with uh, with the score but they were normally like not very Im important scenes as such you know it was, it was mostly kind of like travel scenes that we had to kind of rewrite uh, quite often but because uh, it was it was kind of you know the scenes that place you in like okay now you're going here there was, so yeah, wasn't the transitional ones. yeah transition yeah. was that wasn't like you know wasn't exactly like in his head but like outside of him you know that was kind of those were the scenes that kind of took sometimes a little time to find the right way how to score and then of course the ending was you know this long montage in the in the end you know when, when he's dancing on the car and all of that like we we went through quite a few versions of that and the and the music and that and that scene was like i mean i think the whole the, the first version of that scene must have been like 10 minutes or something so it was like this ridiculously long <laughs> sweet <laughs> just kept you're talking, on you're talking about on the music yeah, yeah 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 no i mean it was like a whole kind of non-dialogue musical suite with you know his him like you know dancing on all these cars and, and all these people oh you're saying him. yeah so, and, and, you know yeah, yeah, yeah no, you that, could, that, what's that. funny is i literally my for my next question no bs is yeah. what went into the scene at the end when the joker stood on the cop car and smeared blood on his face because between the cinematography and the music, it's this exceptional scene. Yeah, with no yeah. dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah like exactly. So yeah, exactly. So the music is like and music. Yeah. <laughs> no, and it's thrilling. I mean, yeah. I actually, as a just a film fan, yeah, I was obviously you know knew every part of the scene and was there photographing and everything, and it still had so much impact for me as an audience yeah. member when I saw that, yeah. like with a crowd of people. Yeah. It was thrilling. It's yeah. like operatic, and it yeah. really—it's like it. There's such a sense of, um, of satisfaction you feel as an audience member to get to that moment. Yeah. Like it really is thrilling. Yeah. I, I think that scene is is it, it, one of the things I'm impressed about the movie, and in part it's the score, in part it's the editing, and it's all of it is just the slow burn that mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. and that. The wins are small, and they're yeah. and the, but cumulatively, it can get to a moment like that, yeah. and have such power, yeah. you know, as if you just you know, yeah. took out Thanos. I don't yeah. know. I mean, musically, <laughs> it was it was kind of, it was f for me like his his character was so you know he's so direct, he's so just like kind of you know simple at heart, and just really trying to understand what's happening, and he's just like, why don't I fit in? Why don't I fit in? Why don't and you know? Then he starts to understand more and more about what's happened to him and I, I think all of that required like so much simplicity and so all the all the melodies are, are just like almost have no harmony it's, it's just like him going through a thought process that's just like very kind of linear and very kind of almost monotonic you know and then for the end when all of the elements of him you know where he's understood all of his elements that are like you know coming together and his anger and frustration has kind of just taken over and he's become this 
this multi-dimensional character, which which he he didn't really start out to be. And then I was just like, okay, and then harmonies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was just it was really fun to to score yeah. that because it was just like, like you say, it was it was almost like operatic after after going through like two hours of like maybe two harmonies, you know. It was just like harmony, you know. Yeah, and it yes. takes them a while to get there. Yeah. It's yep. very slow and yeah. meditative. You yeah. know, it takes yeah. them a while to stand up. It yeah. takes them a while. Exactly. It's like by the time he does that, yeah. it's like, it is, it's, it's, I think the pace of it is yeah. in large part to what's its success. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's I, never, I it's never that. rushing to no, get there. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting about that scene is that's another scene that I think you can make a strong argument never happened. That when he is in the police car going to Arkham, mm -hmm. you can make the argument in his, he's dreaming or he's thinking and that whole thing. Of course you can, is, yeah. absolutely. It's, yeah. And that that's why I think, again, the film is so good because yeah. we can have that argument both sides, yeah. you know? And, but I think that's exactly, it comes comes back to the, what I was saying in the beginning. It's just like, I think this film just gives the audience so much space to think about like how they are perceiving the story and, and exactly ask this question, like, is it real? Is it not real? Like, what does this mean? Was You know, it's just like, it really, it just it's it's a kind of open canvas to what you what you want to take from it and i think that's what makes it yeah. so beautiful you know it's it's a uh, hundred mm. percent uh one of the things that i think uh people aren't gonna re or maybe they'll realize or not know is that joaquin uh was finding things on set and being uh, improvising a lot in the moment and stuff but as a cinematographer how is it to be capturing that when you're not exactly like, for example, that refrigerator scene yeah. where you don't know Joaquin's going in the refrigerator and you are shooting it without knowing where the end is going? So what is that like as a DP, you know what I mean, with the Russian roulette of every scene? Yeah, it's, it's something that, frankly, Todd and I have continued to explore through all of our movies, which is to give as much freedom to the actors, give as much freedom to Todd, uh, and just allow us to put an environment in place in which we can explore those things. So we like to do masters, we like to run scenes from top to bottom. So because of that, often that first take of whatever we're shooting is often the first time we're figuring it out in real time. And so in this case, it was an extension of that. So for me, I, I, put, I knew that was gonna be a big part of making the movie. And so a lot of it was like, okay, how can I light the spaces in which it's not lighting at 360 in a flat way, but to light it in a, a way that he can basically go anywhere within the space and there'll still be something dynamic within the frame to capture it so that I didn't feel like we had to limit where Joaquin could go. That, bat, that, that, that um, kitchen thing was part of what we started doing as we sort of explored and Todd and Joaquin started having conversations about what's happening with this character. And, and that later stuff we shot in the movie was actually a lot of the stuff in the apartment. So because of that, he already knew, he's like, this guy's probably suffering from massive insomnia. He hasn't slept in weeks. What would happen? What would you start doing when, you, when this would happen? And so we would add on little tidbits each day along with our other work and say, well, we're just gonna do some moment here. So we actually shot two things in that kitchen. And the second one was that, that uh, climbing into the refrigerator. So Todd was effectively like, we're gonna do something in the kitchen. Yeah. So we just set up two cameras. You know, one was through the, like the one little opening. And we designed the sets in such a way that we knew we could always get the camera a little further away and not be in front. So we could always master something out. So that little breakfast nook window was one angle and the other one was through the door that goes into there. And then we just sort of saw what happened and you know, I put it on a slider scene. and allow it to happen. And I had no idea. I remember operating on the B camera, which was the one through the side window. And I literally like craned my head and like, what's he doing? <laughs> He's like taking out all these things. And then when he disappeared, <laughs> the camera I was on, you don't even, he just disappears out of the frame. And I like leaned over to be like, did he just crawl in the fridge? I think he just crawled in the fridge. I remember going home that night going, I don't know if this will ever make the movie, but that was one of the most bonkers things I've ever I seen. He just it. like crawled yeah. inside the fridge. It's so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really uh, I'm surprised that hasn't become like a me like a challenge. Yeah, the fridge yeah, yeah. challenge. Well, let's where make sure like, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, you know. People are just emptying their fridges and going inside their fridges. Uh, 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 the, the thing that's interesting is uh, I've spoken to Deacons before, and he he doesn't shoot coverage. He has like one camera, yeah. and that's the way it goes. And I've spoken to other people who like they'll have three, four cameras going to have a lot of coverage. 
What was it like typically, how do you typically like to work and how was it for this in terms of what was the most cameras you had and were you ever just shooting with one camera? Yeah, many times we'd shoot with one camera. I think for me, since I was operating the B camera, I would always jam the B camera in because, and it would often be literally at the last minute. So we would design the shot as single camera as we could. Um, and then the B camera became like a more experimental version of the A camera. So everything was designed around the A camera and because I was operating the B camera, I could throw it in literally at the last minute and I knew I was never compromising the A camera. So we made sure no matter what, we were always, sometimes when you have multiple cameras, you're getting two worse shots instead of like, you know, one really good one. And so the intent was always make sure we're never compromising the one camera. That's its intent. And then, and then the B camera could just kind of be a little more wild and adventurous. And so that often was an angle that was really weird or, or just in a position where I could do it and not be photographing the other camera. So that was our main objective. And then, I mean, we had eight cameras on Murray Franklin simply because we had four cameras actually photographing the show on every single take. They were hidden inside little prop old 1970s like cameras, pedestal cameras. So that was four cameras. And then we had three other cameras and sometimes we'd have a fourth one there too. So we didn't always shoot one camera. Sometimes it was also to get a bunch of the coverage and not have to make Joaquin do it a thousand times, you know? Sure. Uh, I'm curious about your writing process. So how do you typically, I've, is writing music similar to, I speak to a lot of screenwriters and they'll talk about how they'll wake up in the morning and for the first three, four hours of the day, they feel really inspired and they can do it. And at a certain point, it just sort of ends the inspiration. And I've spoken to others that can do nine to five. It's like it's their job writing nine to five. How do you typically write? Um, well, I try not to work crazy long hours because I think that that doesn't serve my um, creative process very well. So I, th I think I'm. I have a, f a few hours of like very creative work and where, where I normally work pretty fast and I just have to kind of capture what I'm what I'm thinking. But that kind of that time period can fluctuate like a lot. I mean, if, if I'm just if I'm editing stuff, you know, I'll, I'll work like crazy long hours. But but for actual like music writing for me, it's a rather um, it's a pretty well. I mean, I guess for for everyone, it's it's a pretty like delicate process. So I have to I have to come to it with with uh, with very kind of soft gloves. So I just have to give myself a lot of space. Like for example, in this in this project, I had to really spend some time just just sitting down and and uh, because you know obviously I didn't have any footage to work with. So I'm I'm just working with with uh, what I got from the script and and you know I just had to spent a lot of time of channeling how do I feel to be inside of Arthur's head like what does Arthur's head sound like and it took it took me a while to kind of sit with it and you know play around with stuff until I until I kind of found his notes and then I was just like it was it was almost like being punched in the chest like it came like a <gasps> that's him <laughs> that's him that's what he wants to say and then I just had to kind of then I had to capture it you know but it kind of sometimes it takes a while to get there and and that's pretty unpredictable, like how, how and when that happens, and and um, but every single project is is uh, is is pretty different, you know. And, and for Chernobyl, for example, which was the last project I, I well I worked on simultaneously with um, to the Joker, that process was really really different because that was much more based on field recordings and and kind of processing material that I was gathering from a, a nuclear power plant, you know. So it's a it's a completely different working process. So I tried to just. Um, I try to approach every project with very kind of open ears and an open mind and just like look at what every project needs for the story to be served best. But, um, but yeah, like I said, it just, I try to give myself as much headspace as I can within the, within the schedule to, to do that. I'm curious when it comes, when you think back on the writing process of all the music you did, mm -hmm. what's the one What's the piece of music that maybe came the easiest? Is there one that just you kept on going back to, like, this is not good, this is not good? You know what I mean? Like drilling down to try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I, I tend to, um, 
if if I if if I start feeling like this is not good, then I I normally just have to step away from it. Then then normally it's it's you know it's then I just know that it's never going to be good if I if I have to kind of drill on it, you know. But um, but for example the um, uh, the music that this the music that came to me to the um, the bathroom dance uh, scene that was the first that that was the kind of aha moment of. of when I was punched in the chest, you know, the, the, um, that's when I knew, like, this is his music, like, that, that is it, and everything else is going to be based from, the, like, this is the starting point, like, this is his head, you know, this, these are his emotions. And that was, like, it was really clear, like, that was um, very obvious. And uh, some of the other themes also came came uh, pretty pretty easily, and I, and I tried to... Uh, I try not to let anything like I try not to send anything, you know, to the director um, unless I'm like actually like really happy with it. If, unless I know like for 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 real that it's that it's that it's uh, something behind it. Uh, completely. Yeah. Um, I am because uh, otherwise it can end up with a temp, and you're like, damn, why did I send it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> like, that's the that, thing yeah, for that's sure. <laughs> Were you like, ever jammed for time on this movie? Like, did you ever have a deadline in which he needed one more? Uh, one more piece, and you're like, ah, I, I, yeah, I need a little more time. Or yeah. were you, or was it? No, there was definitely some moments of like, of, of yeah, yeah. jam moments. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> I just wonder because <laughs> yeah. you know it's interesting because it's a solitary experience for mm -hmm. a lot of it, right? Where mm -hmm. you're able to write like a screenwriter would, and then sometimes there's the pressure of time. I obviously have to work with time pressure every single day. Yeah. So it's just an experience that I'm used to. Uh, yeah. And sometimes the time is a good thing, meaning the lack yeah. thereof. It's like it, it creates, yeah. it forces you yes, to, exactly. to drive in a direction yeah. because you don't have enough time to explore every single one. Yeah, you know. exactly. No, it, it, definitely, it definitely often helps having, it creates like a certain energy where yeah. you're just like, okay, what am I doing? What am I doing? And you just <laughs> have to get <laughs> But uh, it, it definitely helps when the, when the beginning stages are, are you know, spacious and, right, you, ha and right. you have a lot of time in the beginning, you know, which was the case for this this project, then, then it makes the whole um, crunch periods easier yes, yeah. because you can fall back on, you know, at least I'm not going to get fired, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which is probably when, when, more common yeah. for composers than yeah. it is for well, cinematographers, I don't know. I mean, yeah, least, exactly. Yeah. When did you stop thinking you were going to get fired? <laughs> No, I mean, that, that was the beautiful thing about this project was that I was good. like, I'm daily. probably not going to get fired. <laughs> I, I think they have the music in there already. Yeah. They're like, wait a second. <laughs> All right. Uh, I got to wrap up with you guys, but real fast. Uh, what's the next thing that you guys have coming up? I have nothing. I'm just, I'm taking a bit of uh, time to, to uh, digest everything that's come out so far. So I'm just uh, giving myself some headspace. Okay. No, nothing planned. Uh, in the short term, I'm going to Poland to Camry Maj, which is like a cinematography festival, which I'm ecstatic about because I've never been. And it's a real celebration of 100%. the craft. And Joker's going to play there and excited about that. In the longer term, it looks like there's another a bigger DC property that I think I'm going to do. I can't, I'm not going to say it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> uh, it'll, it'll, it will, we'll work it out soon. Uh, that, first good. of all, that's awesome. And my last thing for you, um, I've been asking everyone about this. What TV show would you love to guest shoot? And what TV show would you love to guest compose? That's a great question. Yeah. That's... Shoot The Crown. Love The Crown. It's amazing. I haven't seen I mean, there's that. so many, actually, but yeah. The Crown... That's what I was going to say. It's just like, there's so many out there. It's like, who has time to see all the TV Yeah, yeah, show? yeah. I mean, there's a lot. I, a the Crown lot. is the first one that came to my head, but yeah. Yeah. God, I have no idea. Is there anything that you binged watch recently that you loved? Uh, I haven't really had time to watch anything, seriously. I... I um... This explains why you're not taking work. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Why They See Us was, was uh, really, really good. Which one? Uh, why, it's called Why They See Us? When They See Us. Uh, no, I don't know. No, exactly. No, that, that, was, um, that was really good. I, I watched that. I liked that. Yeah. What would I like to compose? It would have to be, yeah. something, it would have to be something very simple. Right. Like, 
That's uh, probably the extent to which I, I could do it. I'll yeah. leave it there and just say, yeah. I mean it sincerely. Both of you guys did such phenomenal work on this movie. I so appreciate you coming in the studio. And uh, I wish you guys nothing but the best. Hey, thanks. Thank this you. was fun. Thank you. Appreciate cool. it. Thank and you. I got to meet Hilda finally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we don't get to no, meet exactly. that much. No, exactly. We never get yeah, to meet. One time on set. Yeah. It's so yeah. crazy. That's bonkers. Yeah. It's so yeah. crazy. Exactly. No, but seriously, congrats. And Thank on that you. note, thanks everyone for watching.